invite you guys to go ahead and stand up. And if you're towards the back, I actually want to invite you to come forward. We want to be as close as possible as a TFC family, as a TFC community. Um, and we want to worship together. So if you're in the back and if you're in the sides, come close to this middle aisle. Come close. We're all here to worship Jesus together as a family and to learn more about understanding Muslims and how to get them to know this Jesus who we speak of. So thank you guys so much. And uh, I just ask you guys to, to worship with us as we sing about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, only Jesus. We 
sing holy. Holy King Almighty, Lord, saints and angels all adore, I join with them and bow before Jesus, only so holy, so set apart, God, that you are worthy of all praise. And God, right now, we, we thank you so much for that name that has such power, the name, the power to change lives and to draw all people to yourself, Lord. God, so as we continue to learn more about how to understand Muslims, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts, that you would break our hearts for these people. God, that your, your name we pray. Amen. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to Marvelous Monday Evening. And we're here with Ed Smither again tonight, Dean of College of Intercultural Studies at Columbia International University. He holds degrees from North Carolina State University, Liberty University, University of Wales, and University of Pretoria. And I think he needs another degree or two, right? Uh, yes, served 14 years in intercultural ministry, working 
among Muslims in France, North Africa, and the USA, has written four books, and he is married to Sean, and they have three amazing, hilarious, wild kids, his words, not mine, okay, and they enjoy hiking, watching movies, discovering lighthouses at the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Ed is an ordained Southern Baptist minister, and they live in Irmo, South Carolina. Ed enjoys biking, coaching youth soccer, drinking bold, burnt coffee, and listening to bands in the genre of Switchfoot and U2, and also very old hymns. And Ed, we welcome you back tonight. Welcome, Ed Smither. thinking about my son uh, coming up here. He told me before I left, he said, Dad, I'm glad you're not here for Halloween uh, because uh, I'm not getting home till Wednesday. So he has a three-day start on his candy. Um, you can always look forward to when the kids, when we put the kids down, you know, after going trick-or-treating and Halloween and everything, um, try to get them to bed a bit early trick-or-treating, not so they can get up ready for school tomorrow, but it's so I can get a quicker look at what my take is going to be, you know. I mean, it's my house, and, you know, so I just have this kind of 40% deal with my kids, but plus I look through, and I'm like, you know, Butterfingers, you know, this, this stuff's it's nasty. You don't want to eat that. And so they don't really buy it anymore, but I see, uh, so you are the people that aren't trick-or-treating, although, actually, can you stand up, please? Yeah, yeah, stand up. All right. Any, anybody else? Did you just come dressed for this like this, or you just felt like it? You do this every Monday night, right? Okay. Well, why not? So, well, thanks for coming out uh, again, and uh, and we want to continue what we started talking about this morning in terms of understanding Muslims. And let me say that what I'd like to do, I think we're going all the way up to 7 o'clock, and uh, what I'd like to do is talk for about maybe 30 minutes, um, although I was in a class this afternoon and I thought this is going to be really quick and we're going to end early and we didn't get through hardly half of what I thought we would, but uh, interesting things to talk about. Um, but what I'd like to do is open it up for your questions. And so just so you're thinking now uh, about questions, and if you don't have any, that would be fine too, but, uh, uh, but let's go ahead and, and get into this. Uh, let me pray for us one more time. And then we'll, we'll get on with it. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we do worship you. We thank you that we're washed in your blood. Lord, we adore you. And, and Lord, we want you to be glorified in all the earth. And Lord, even as we were singing these songs tonight, Lord, I thought about so many Muslim friends who don't worship you, don't have a savior. Lord, we pray that the blood of Jesus would wash away their sins and they would come to know you. Lord, at dinner we were talking about Somali immigrants in Minneapolis and how so much work has been done and so few have come to know you. Lord, would you touch the heart of Somali in Minneapolis tonight? Lord, would you touch Muslim and other immigrants in Clarkston, Georgia tonight and draw them to you? Father, guide uh, my thoughts guide our time together, that, Lord, you would be glorified, that you would be honored. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if there's somebody, um, apart from Donald Trump, that's been stealing the headlines um, over the last couple of years, um, it would be ISIS, or um, actually, I'm going to see if this even actually would work, if I can get it to work. Still doesn't seem to be working for me. Would you guys mind advancing it? I tried. Okay. Sometimes um, when we when we talk about ISIS, um, we hear the terms uh, ISIS, uh, ISIL. Sometimes you hear President Obama use that term, uh, IS, uh, and all of that stands for a couple of things. Um, could be the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or the Islamic State in the Levant, which this area on the map here of Syria, Iraq, Lebanon is in the Middle East is, is called the Levant area. Uh, 
uh, sometimes it's just IS, the Islamic State. And actually in the British news and in Arabic, ISIS is called Desh, which is basically all that I've just said, but in Arabic. Um, and so you see the region, and actually this map is a little bit uh, dated here because just in the last couple of weeks, uh, Mosul has been overtaken from the Islamic State. But you see the areas um, where the Islamic State is controlling, and we might ask ourselves the question, why? How has this developed? And, and so in the first part of tonight, I want to focus on a little bit of history, some more recent history, some uh, more distant history. And then I want to ask the question, how are people responding to ISIS? And what are the opportunities? When you think about what's happened in the country of Iraq in the last 20 years, in the last 10 years, we have a leader like Saddam Hussein who was deposed and he was, he was put to death. And many people thought, great, a dictator has gone and now Iraq will be a free society. But what people fail to realize, including the U.S. government, uh, is that Iraq is a, is, a, is a tribal type of society where there are kinship networks. Um, and Saddam was part of a ruling, the Ba'athist party, so he was a, a Sunni Muslim, which, which is actually the largest sect of Muslims in the world. Um, but Iraq is predominantly a Shia or a Shiite country. And so when a strong dictator was removed, the country went into chaos. And we start to see people that had been fighting each other for, for decades. After Saddam was gone, they just kind of, of re-engaged in that fighting, and it created a vacuum of power. Similarly, in, in Syria, um, uh, when we look at Syria, Syria was controlled by the Assad family, um, Hafez Assad, and then his son Bashir Assad, who came to power uh, within the last 10 years. And so since the 1970s, the Assad family has ruled Syria. There's been very little political freedom. And of course, in the beginning of 2011 was the Arab Spring, and that actually began. I, I, I used to live in Tunisia, North Africa. That The Arab Spring was set off in a town called Sidi Bouzid. Uh, it was set off by a young man uh, named Mohamed Bouazizi, who was an unemployed university graduate who wanted to, um, who was trying to um, provide for his family. He was selling fruit on the street, um, and the police came and said, you don't have a permit to sell fruit. And here he was, an unemployed uh, university graduate, just trying to do what he could, and his livelihood was taken away. And so he returned back in front of the city hall, doused himself in gasoline, and set himself on fire. And he became the icon or the figure for the Arab Spring. And in very short order, the dictator of Tunisia, Zin al um, um bin Ali, was deposed. Uh, he had been leading, uh, he had been the leader of Tunisia, the dictator, for almost uh, 30 years, and he quickly left. And then the, the Arab Spring spread to Egypt, and there was a regime change there. There were attempts in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Morocco. It spread around the Arab world, and there were attempts in Syria. And so there was an, a moderate revolution against the Assad regime in Syria as well that has just continued to this day. And we see scenes of what Aleppo looks like, what Damascus looks like, and it's a really sad situation. And so... Because of the, the vacuum of power in Syria and Iraq, this set the stage for another group to come in and to take control of that and to, to assume power in this vacuum, and that is the Islamic State. Um, if we go to the next slide. You see on the left-hand side there, this is, uh, this is uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He is the self-proclaimed caliph of Islam. Caliph is the ancient word, it, it probably best translates king, um, but when the prophet Muhammad um, was, uh, was in a sense beginning Islam, um, we, he wasn't really beginning a new religion. What Muhammad was doing was leading an Arab Muslim, a new Arab Muslim empire or an Arab empire uh, that had a religion at its center and so for us to look back and say that Islam is a religion uh, of violence um, is really not, not quite accurate. 
because all civilizations and dynasties have been advanced through military force and power. If you look at the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, and they were deeply religious. Um, sometimes we look back through the lenses of the separation of church and state, and we assume that there's a separation of religion and state at all times. Ironically, in the history of the church, um, in, we were talking about this afternoon in class with, with the development of Christendom, there have, been, there, has, there have been church and state unions, and the church has gotten into real problems, and that's one of the nice things about the values of, in the American experiment is that there would be a separation of religion and state. But, but the rise of Islam, this what I would call an Arab Muslim empire, led by uh, a spiritual, economic, uh, political, and military leader, Muhammad, who led uh, the Muslim community to, to take the cities of, of Medina and to Mecca and to start to expand into the rest of Arabia. And so Islam has always been deen wa dawla, is what Muslims say. They say religion and state. And so there has never really been in the mind of Muslims that it would be historically that this would be separate. And so what Baghdadi is trying to capitalize on is he's trying to reclaim that early classical Islam um, claim to state and uh, military power. And we, of course, know these are, uh, it's not only been in Syria and Iraq, but the failed state of Libya has become a haven for the Islamic State as well. And we see the 21 Coptic Egyptian Christians uh, that were martyred, uh, and, and an incredible testimony, actually, for our Lord uh, that they had in that. But the Islamic State, it's, it's, it's quite phenomenal, actually, um, if we want to call it that, because it's really a group, if you add up all of the people that are part of the Islamic State, it probably adds up to about 30 to maybe 50,000 people. And let's just say that in the world there are another total of 1 million people, 1 million Muslims that sympathize with ISIS. That's 1 million out of 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And so it's a very small group of people, relatively speaking, uh, that have media savvy, they have videographers, um, and they, they get into the news, they use social media in a very uh, savvy way. They've been involved in recruiting people through social media. Um, they have the ability to, to generate income. One of the interesting things that ISIS does is that they have these trucks and they, they refine oil. So in, the, in Iraq and Syria, where there are oil fields, especially in Iraq, um, they, they use these trucks and they refine oil and they sell oil on the black market. And ironically, in Syria, one of the biggest uh, customers of the Islamic State in the oil market is the Syrian government that they're fighting against. So go figure. You would think that maybe the government wouldn't buy their oil and, and would shut them down. But a, very, a, a group that's very good at, at getting media attention, um, and I think through the media can lead people like us to think that this is what Islam is all about. And, and, and we'll come back to that. Um, but um, can we go to the next one, please? On the left, we have Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and I'll introduce the other guy in the right. Um, but uh, why don't we go on to the next one. Through, through Islamic history, again, we talked about the first generation of the Arab Muslim experiment where Muhammad was leading. Uh, he died in the year 632. From 632 to 661, it was called the period of the rightly guided caliphs, and they began to control all of what is now Saudi Arabia. It was just Arabia. Uh, they expanded into Persia, and then um, in from 661 to the year 750, the Abbasid Islamic dynasty ruled from Damascus. And you see this is how much of the world uh, the Arab Muslim Empire was controlling by the year 750. Um, can we go on to the next one? And then uh, we see on through the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire came to power in the mid-13th century and was actually ruling until 1923. And just to put this in perspective, the last time the Chicago Cubs won the World Series, the Ottoman Empire was in power. So, all right, so I have to 
say something about the text here. Um, where I hope you're praying for the text. So anyway, but when we when we look at at Islam through through the ages, it's been religion plus state dynasties until we get back uh, to and we go back to this picture again in the next slide where we see Baghdadi on the left, the self-proclaimed Caliph today of Islam, wanting to reenact an Islamic dynasty. But on the right, who's the guy? Now he's on the right by the cancer people doing lots of money and food. Anybody recognize him? Someone on the very other end of the Muslim world. This is Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who was the architect of modern Turkey. And in 1923, he ended the last Muslim dynasty. He ended the Ottoman Empire. And it was, it, was a, it was a big mistake because he allied himself politically with Germany in the First World War. Um, but he, and, and so that was, that was political suicide for any Islamic influence. Um, but in a short period of time, Ataturk changed the script. Turkish used to be a language that used Arabic script and, and read from right to left. Um, he changed the currency, he changed, he modernized and secularized modern Turkey. Now what's interesting right now is that the country of Turkey is really thinking through its identity in terms of Islam and things like that. So Baghdadi and Ataturk were both Muslims, but they had very, very different, they have or had very different views on what Islam looks like in the modern world. If you go to the next slide, what's very interesting, too, uh, in terms of um, world political history in the 20th century, these are the Arab countries uh, of the Middle East and North Africa. Most of those were colonized by um, England or France um, in the 20th century, but most of these uh, countries got their independence in the 1950s, some in the 1960s. And what's very interesting is when they received their independence, none of them became Islamic states. They did not go back to the Ottoman style leadership or the earlier thing. A, a country like Tunisia or Morocco, they, they crafted their constitution after the French style of constitution. Now these are, are Muslim countries, but they, they didn't want to be Islamic states with Sharia law. And so it's not until 1979 with the Iranian revolution that we see an Islamic country, and later Sudan will follow, um, that wants to be an Islamic state. And so, so what we have um, in this period, if we go on to the, to the next slide, and even on to the next, when we look at the, the motivations for political Islam uh, in the 21st century, one of the biggest things that we have is an identity crisis for Muslims. Because again, historically, Islam or, or the Arab Muslim Empire that of course expanded outside of the Arab world, only about 20% of Muslims today are Arabs, uh, although that's where it began. But in the 20th century especially, there, there is a bit of a political identity crisis. Because uh, Islam has always been religion and state together. And so in the 20th century, we are just a few movements. But we see in Egypt, in the mid-20th century, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, that develops. And the Muslim Brotherhood came to political power in Egypt not long ago. We see in Lebanon uh, the party of God, Hezbollah, uh, that started. And then we start to see groups like Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram and now... ISIS, these are kind of different groups. And we might think that they're all in it together, but it's interesting sometimes to hear Al-Qaeda leadership denounce what ISIS is doing. So they're not all on the same page in terms of, uh, they, they don't really coordinate or network necessarily. But part of the motivation for political Islam in the 20th and 21st century uh, honestly comes from a reaction to the West, and I'm, I'm not defending this, I'm just trying to help you to understand where someone involved in ISIS or Al-Qaeda, where they might be coming from. So for instance, after World War I, um, there were Western governments, and you can read into the history, I'm not going to try to indict anyone here, but there were Western governments that, uh, that 
it said to the, to the Arab countries that were under the Ottoman Empire, if you will ally with us and if you will fight against the Ottomans, then we'll give you your own autonomous states. They did that, that happened, and after World War I, uh, the Western governments reneged on that promise. Uh, and that's just a fact of history. Uh, one of the other things is that as Muslims began to interact with, with Western governments and Western countries uh, that were more secular. And so Saeed Qutb, who's the spiritual father of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, he was an international student in Colorado in the United States. Uh, he was a secular Muslim. He was, a, I, I believe, he was a school teacher. He came to the United States, uh, probably like some of you, um, not, not in this case, but his, his mom slid a Quran into his suitcase. Maybe your parents slid a Bible into your suitcase and said, read this, you know, and go, go off to school, and if you're going to Crow Falls, you're going to learn the Bible. But, but his Egyptian mom said, you're going to the U.S., you need to, you need to really be a good Muslim, and so, and he wasn't really interested in Islam. You know what got him interested in Islam? The immorality that he saw in American culture. And so he was reacting to what he encountered as a student. Um, and he went and he, who was just a very nominal Muslim, became uh, what we might call radicalized. Some other things, um, the, the United States' support for Israel has been difficult for many Arabs and Muslims. Um, and the fact that there have been uh, American military and Western military forces um, in Arab countries in places like Saudi Arabia. And so I was attending a conference at a university um, in Tunisia, and this was after the U.S. had come into Iraq, and there was a sociologist and a historian, an Arab historian, who gave a paper or referred to Iraq as the new American colony. And again, from his perspective, what he was saying is military forces on our land, it's just a new form of colonization. Again, I'm not defending this. I'm just trying to help you get into uh, into the the minds of, of political Muslims. If we go to the next slide, another motivation for political Islam would be poverty and uh, limited economic opportunities. This was what really sparked the Arab Spring. It was it was a poor, uh, unemployed person, young man trying to. Uh, trying to earn a, a, a basic living by selling food on the street. And uh, I, I taught at the University of Tunis for several years. And I watched students come into the university and a high number of them, perhaps as high as 40% of the students that we taught went to unemployment after their university studies. Um, and so that is frustrating when there are limited economic opportunities. Um, I have a friend, uh, we'll call him Bilgasam, and he was sitting in a cafe um, in, in a country in North Africa. He was unemployed, he was feeling his self-esteem was low, and he was, he was looking uh, through uh, uh, an Arabic language newspaper. And there were people inviting people to come and be jihadists, to, to be freedom fighters in Iraq to fight against uh, the Western enemy, the Western devil, the U.S. forces and others. And so he got, he secretly got his money together um, and he ended up uh, going through, through Syria and into Iraq and he started to train with, uh, with a militia and he was going to fight um, against the Western enemy. Um, except he got there, when the fighting started, he thought, what am I doing? And it, it, what's very interesting is his own family in North Africa saw him on TV being interviewed with freedom fighters. And they were just horrified that their son had gone uh, to do that. And so I was worshiping at an international church, and Bill Gossam came into our doors one day. Um, and I ended up having a chance to talk with him, and he goes, I would like to meet. Americans and other Westerners because I went to kill people and I feel really bad about that. I would like to write a letter to the President of the United States and to the Ambassador 
to our country to say how sorry I am for one of you children when I didn't know him. And over a period of time, we began to read the Bible with him and shook hearts with him. And he made a profession of faith in Christ. And in fact, I'm even hearing reports now that members of ISIS and other groups are actually turning to the Lord. Um, but what I learned about Ugasim was that he, he was looking for communities like. In fact, a lot of times I, I kind of liken it to someone joining a gang. That it kind of becomes uh, like a family. It becomes uh, a place of support. So this is another reason. Quite related to limited economic opportunities are the tyranny of, of Muslim governments. Um, and so the lack of political freedom that we see in lots of the Muslim world has led to, to groups um, that have wanted to return Muslims to, uh, to the blessed period of the seventh century uh, when Muhammad was, was living. So it's interesting, if you go to the next slide, well, we pause just for a second and we ask the question, so does ISIS represent true Islam? And I would just reiterate what I said this morning is that ISIS in particular and expressions of radical Islam, the other groups that we've mentioned, might add up to one million Muslims in the world. But if we do the math, one million out of 1.6 billion, it's still very much a, a small fraction of people. Sometimes when people ask, does ISIS represent Islam, it's kind of, I say, well, does Westboro Baptist Church represent Christianity? And that's kind of, I think, I think it's, that's not a, a, an unrealistic parallel. The, one, the other thing that we have to realize is the people that suffer the most at the hands of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram are other Muslims. Now, I know that we... Um, that, I mean, this is a good thing to do. We, we keep track of how many uh, U.S. American soldiers lose their lives. We remember their sacrifice. But that's a fraction of how many Muslims, other Muslims who are just trying to um, shop, go to school, and live their lives. Um, uh, they are the ones that, are, that suffer. I have a a, a Syrian friend of mine that I met in Turkey, he was a refugee in Turkey, and I, I asked him, how did you get here? He goes, well, my university was bombed. There's no more university. So imagine you're trying to study for finals or for, for an exam, or, um, and, um, and your university is just bombed. And that's, that's what happened to him. He's just trying to, to live his life. And so... Does ISIS represent uh, part of the global picture of Islam? It does. Um, does. Are there verses in the Quran that seem violent? I mean, sometimes called the sword verses, yes. Uh, do all Muslims want to be violent? No. In fact, I was living in the Muslim world when 9-11 happened. And my phone would not stop ringing with Muslim friends who were calling. And they were saying two things. First of all, did anyone in your family get killed in New York? And number two, do you know how embarrassed and sorry and grieved that we are about this? So my, my experience is that, well, first of all, is that most Muslims aren't going to distance themselves um, from this. Well, let's look at a couple of responses. Um, the outcome, so if you look at the next slide, um, and um, go, go on to the, the next line, actually. What's interesting to me is to see what other Muslims say about ISIS. And so Al-Azhar University, which is probably the leading theological institution uh, in the world that trains imams and Muslim theologians, it's in, it's in Egypt, in Cairo. They say that the Islamic State is corrupt and a danger to Islam. That's their official theological position. Uh, Saudi Arabia's highest religious authority calls uh, ISIS terrorists like the Islamic State the number one enemy, enemy of Islam. Um, the Islamic Society of North America, they say the Islamic State's actions are to be denounced, are in no way representative of what Islam actually teaches. And so sometimes I used to hear people say, you know, if, if Muslims are against 
radically to some, why don't we step up and say something? Now, it is true that there are some villages and some places that are overtaken by ISIS or controlled by Boko Haram, and, and other Muslims are afraid to speak out. They're afraid themselves of being terrorized. But we're seeing more and more um, Muslim scholars and others speaking out and saying, this is not Islam. You go to the next slide, what's very interesting to me um, is to see um, what has happened since 1979 in Iraq when an Islamic revolution came in that was then exported to Algeria and to other places. Um, the number of Iranians that began turning to the Lord and, and said, we want nothing to do with this expression of Islam. And so my son and I, we were last summer in Turkey and we were visiting um, Iranian Christians. And uh, in this particular city that we were in, we were visiting one family and they were talking to us about the church uh, with Iranian refugees in Turkey that had started and how they've had to, they've rented an apartment, uh, the top floor of the building to have church services. Uh, and they have to have people out in the halls and, and Iranians are coming to Christ because they reject the Islam that they have experienced in Iran. You go to the next slide. Uh, there's another group, they're actually not Muslims, but they're Yazidis from Iraq. And they have, they have been the ones that ISIS has, has sold their women into slavery and, and, and basically uh, sexually abused them. And the Yazidis, uh, many Yazidis have fled into Turkey. And when I was there last summer, uh, it was interesting that they were wanting to leave Turkey and go to neighboring Bulgaria. And the rationale was, this is what Muslims have done, have done to us. We don't want to be around Muslims anymore. We want to go to a Bulgaria, which is a Christian country where people are dignified and, and, and treat us Correctly. And now again, th that's kind of interesting how, how that logic goes. Um, but we have seen Yazidis who have been turning to the Lord because of the love that they have seen uh, from God's people. And so if you go to the next slide, for that reason, uh, my colleague David Cashin, um, and he put this article on the Zuema Center site, has written an article called um, How ISIS is Spreading the Gospel, where he basically talks about uh, how radical Islam uh, has become uh, a helpful tool for free evangelism. It's people that are saying we don't want this kind of Islam. Um, we want to distance ourselves from it. And it's caused searching, and God can use that. Well, before we go to some questions, um, when we think about our response uh, on the final slide, I think that there's a, We'll talk about this verse a little bit tomorrow. Um, go to the next slide. Um, is this verse from 1 John 4, where John says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Uh, when we, what, what I think we ought to do is to pray for ISIS and to pray for Al Qaeda. On one level, we see people that are searching, that people that, that, that are driven by an ideology that want something better, they're striving for something. Um, but ultimately, like any lost person, they're, they're seeking to fill their soul with something um, that satisfies. And so with that, um, happy to open it up for questions. I don't, do, do we understand that there's a microphone? A uh, person's bringing a microphone. If, if you've got a question, I'd love to hear it. And if I can't answer it, then uh, I'm sure Mr. Penlon will answer it or Dr. Crosby will answer it. Feel free to stand up wherever you are. There's the mic here. You can get some exercise this way. Test, test. It's that on button. Yeah, it's just the thing. Uh, I have a question. Oh, I have a question. Um, 
why do you think the world isn't doing anything about ISIS? Where they're just kind of, it seems like they're just kind of letting it sit there and do what it's doing over there, slowly doing something, but not really going in when it's only 30, 50,000 people. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I don't know if I know. I think that part of, part of the challenge in, I mean, again, I, I don't claim to be, uh, you know, a political planner or uh, it, it is a small group, but it, but it is relatively a small group, but controlling a vast area. Um, and there, there is a big risk assessment involved there in terms of is this, um, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing is, is, is this worth sending in troops for? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I don't think I know the answer to that. What kind of staying power do you think that ISIS has? Do you see it as growing and becoming stronger or something that you see being put out over the next maybe 10 years? My personal opinion is I think it's going to implode from within. I think that um, I think that they're not going to get the power, um, and and I think that there's going to be disillusionment within it, or perhaps it might turn into, you know, there might be other spin-off uh, terrorist groups. Um, but, but I don't think, I mean, we're already seeing, like, the city of Mosul, which is a big city, that's, that's they've lost that ground there. Um, and so I, I think that, um, I, I think that, I think the fuel for it is going to run out. Mike, you yeah, okay? Now, I might be a little, little, jumping ahead a little bit on this question, but I uh, don't know that we pinned any other chapels this week, so I thought I'd ask you. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric, obviously, in the United States, a lot of Islamophobia and so forth. Uh -huh. um, I hear a lot of conversation, especially in African Muslim-majority countries, of female genital mutilation. And I, I've heard it on both sides of the spectrum that it's an African problem and it's a Muslim problem. Are there, like, any, you know, lasting effects of, of, of the, I mean, are, is, in essence, is Islam, you know, in any way uh, influential on that uh, horrific practice? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, obviously, this has been a way for a long time where, where within Islam, women have been suppressed. Um, but it's also been an African tradition. Um, but you, you see, what's interesting is to see um, NGOs, um, kind of um, health NGOs that are educating women um, and, and families in this. And so there are some deep-seated traditions um, but yeah, I think I think it's 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 you see it both as a form within Islam, and so you see it in places like Sudan and Egypt and other places, um, and um, so yeah, it's from both sides. Um, my question is, I, I know my dad. I've talked with him a lot, uh, and just trying to soften his heart towards his uh, preconceptions about Muslims, and. Uh, he often brings up a lot of verses about violence in the Quran. Uh, what is the, uh, what, I guess I'm asking, what is the typical Muslim's approach to the verses about violence in uh, the Quran, specifically about killing non-Muslims? Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, we want to see it in the context of history, that, that it, was, it was an Arab empire that was expanding with its military. Uh, some Muslims, they they interpret those verses again there's a variety of interpretation so think about think about how many christians you know who interpret the bible very very differently um, it's that and some within the world of islam and so some would say that those refer to um, self defense as as a developing state or others that god was behind it kind of like joshua and leading the israelites and uh, and it was god's will so what God wants, God only commands moral things. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, I, I think when we 
think about Islam in the modern world and its compatibility with, compatibility with the modern world, I mean, again, the Muslims that I know don't really see a place for that in terms of, of uh, application today. So, so the sword verses are they're, they're, I think for most Muslims that I know, they're they are kind of liberal on that that they, um, if you will, that they they don't see. You know, we don't have a hermeneutic for today's application of that. Um, so I think I think that's that's the biggest thing to keep in mind. And you know, I mean, um, in an afternoon class today, we mentioned the new Charlemagne, who was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800 when he marched his troops into Saxony. He said something to the effect of, "Convert to the Catholic Church or die." And so we've seen, um, you know, some pretty embarrassing, troubling things. Now, the difference there is that we don't really see that commanded in the Gospels. Um, we see political power and religion together, and it, it gets really messy. Um, but, uh, but Muslims today, you know, applying most of those verses, the average Muslim uh, probably doesn't see uh, an application for that like they see it more historically. So I have another question. Where's okay, sorry. Okay, yes. Uh, you mentioned that the momentum is kind of changing where more and more Muslims are coming out condemning what they're doing, or uh, did I hear you wrong? That uh, more and more Muslims are uh, coming out and saying that what the terrorists are doing, what ISIS is doing, is not what we believe. Yeah. There's more and more? Yeah. Uh, wh what do you think, like, why didn't they do that kind of earlier, and it seems like it's building momentum now compared to in the very beginning? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that, that, that Muslims are just, um, there was a, there was a, a full-page ad taken out. Well, I, actually, it was a it was a group of 130 Muslim scholars about 10 years ago that produced a document called a Common Word, and it was an initiative toward uh, Christian scholars, largely. It was sent to the Vatican. It was sent to other places to basically call for peace. And there was a real desire: enough is enough. Uh, there was a desire to live in peace, um, and so. I think the courage of those 132 uh, have led more people to, to be encouraged by that and to have to have more of a platform and a voice. Yeah, you have to realize too that that prior to the Arab Spring, just to give you an example, um, I I lived in Tunisia, and um, there was a Tunisian paper called La Presse, the Press, and um, and there was no freedom of the press. Um, and so it was always interesting to kind of read the paper. Uh, it was it was just such propaganda, and I had to actually have somebody like scan a copy of La Presse once uh, after the revolution happened because people actually started writing journalistic articles with with some freedom of the press. And so a lot of the Muslim world there's not been this idea of a freedom of the press where where people can. Denounce things, but so I, and I, I think there are other, you know, you know, with the with the development of social media, um, I mean, there there's a lot more of a voice through that. If it's not being suppressed, I think there's there's more. Um, how do you say digital courage uh, for people to? I think those are some of the the trends I see. But I think for some people, they're just enough is enough. You know. Um, over here. Okay. Um. Obviously, immigration in the last year or two has been a hot topic. And when you look at, like, cities like Brussels and London and Paris, and I'm actually doing my senior paper on Iranian immigrants from North America oh, cool. who have immigrated peacefully. But now how do we as a nation, also, but also as Christians, view, I guess, immigration in a way where we see violence that's really stemming from stereotypically Islam, Islamic nation people groups? So how does we as a, how does we as a nation, how does we as how do we as Christians kind of sh how should we approach that? Yeah, and actually tomorrow night that's I don't want to give away too much for tomorrow, but but I think that I think that that safety and self defense shouldn't be the first priority of of people on mission. That if you're if you're ministering in the inner city of Chicago, um, that's that's a dangerous place to serve, but if God calls you there, you know, part part 
like part of mission is to, you know, it, it may involve being in a dangerous place. And I, I think about um, the guy that I know who's ministering on the streets of Philadelphia and he ministers to homeless people. It's a very dangerous place where he's serving. And he grew up in a, in a pretty white neighborhood in East Tennessee and a nice suburban evangelical church. And uh, God called him to this inner city ministry. And it's interesting to hear his own mom, who all she did pray, all she prayed for him for years was, oh, Lord, keep him safe. That she realized in her life of prayer that praying for safety was not the biggest thing God wanted him to do. He was supposed to be faithful and for God to use him. Um, so I'm trying to get back to your original question. Um, you're right, Iranians have come to this country. Uh, for many years, there are thousands of Iranians that have come to Christ, and there are Iranian fellowships in Los Angeles and other places. Um, the The question is, the, the real question, I think, is, uh, is are the, it's, it's very interesting, you mentioned, you mentioned Brussels. Um, let, let's put it into one family. I don't know if you saw the Olympics, but one of the runners, I think it's 1,500 meters for the Brussels team, I think he's from Moroccan background, and so he's grown up in, in Belgium, and he was running and competing on the Olympics, Olympic team, uh, uh, an example to his nation. His brother was part of that plot in Brussels, and they grew up in the same neighborhood. They, they didn't grow up in Syria. They didn't grow up in Iraq. They're, they've not, they may have traveled, the guy may have traveled there, but this was somebody that got radicalized as a troubled teen growing up in Europe. Um, and so part of the question is, is some of the violence that we're talking about in Europe, is it because Syrian refugees are coming into Germany? No, it's actually most of it has to do with people that have already, Muslims that have already immig immigrated and have grown up there and have gotten radicalized. So, got time for one more or? you join me in prayer um, and um, wh why don't we pray for ISIS and for for every Muslim in the world that wants to do harm to someone else thinking that they're being deep harmed Lord I thank you that your arm is not too short to save and Lord even as I think about people wanting to do violence because of religious conviction. Lord, I think about Saul and how he uh, was headed on the road to Damascus to gather up followers of Jesus, thinking that he was doing you a favor. And Lord, I thank you for how you blinded him and how he encountered you and he became a great evangelist. And Lord, I pray for, for ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab Boko Haram and other groups around the world, people that are violent and following an ideology. Lord, we pray that you would speak to them, that you would turn their hearts to you, Lord, that you would save them as you saved Paul. And Lord, we pray that, that members of ISIS today would turn to you and become great evangelists for Jesus. And Lord, you would be glorified. And Lord, as you turn hearts Lord, help us not to be afraid, but to be bold. And um, Lord, perhaps even some of us in this room are radicalized in this country thinking. And we pray that we would be willing and open for that opportunity.